In the first part of this tutorial, we looked at the basics of continuous functions, and now we're going to move on to differentiable functions. So what is a differentiable function? Well, the diagram shows sine of x, which is a differentiable function, and once again, we're going to provide an informal definition first, before looking at the proper definition. So we say that a real valued function is differentiable at a particular point x0 if the graph is sufficiently smooth at that point. Or another thing you can say is that if a function is differentiable at a certain point, that means the graph of the function looks like a straight line if you zoom in far enough on that point. So what are we talking about here? Well, suppose we choose a particular point on the graph of sine x, like x0 equals 1, for example. Now, if we zoom in on that point of the graph, you can see that the further we zoom in, the more it looks like a straight line. And this is going to be the case no matter which point on the graph we choose. And this means that the function is differentiable, because remember, when we differentiate a function at a particular point, what we're doing is we're finding the slope of the tangent line at that point. And the tangent line is the straight line that the function looks like at that particular point. If the graph had any sharp points where the function wasn't smooth, that would mean that the graph would not look like a straight line when we zoomed in on the sharp point, and we wouldn't be able to differentiate it because it would be impossible to draw the tangent line at that point, so it needs to be smooth in order to be differentiable. So remember, these are only informal definitions of differentiability, and it's important to know the proper definition as well. We say a function is differentiable if this limit exists, and you can see that this is actually just the limit of the slope of the tangent line as x approaches x0. And when this limit exists, we call it the derivative of the function at the point x0. So in this tutorial, we've been talking about the properties of continuity and differentiability, but it's important to realise that these are not exactly the same thing. So one thing we want to be clear on is whether it's possible for a function to have one property but not the other. In other words, whether it's possible for the function to be continuous but not differentiable, or vice versa. So imagine the set of all real valued functions. Then the set of continuous functions is contained within that set, because obviously not all functions are continuous. And the set of differentiable functions is actually contained within the set of continuous functions. So that means a function can only be differentiable if it's continuous. And if you think about it, you can't really say a function is smooth at a point where it jumps from one place to another, so of course it can't be differentiable if it isn't continuous. And in fact, the continuous functions that we saw earlier, including polynomial functions, sine of x, cos of x, etc., are also differentiable. So we haven't seen an example yet of a function which is continuous but not differentiable, but we will do that very soon. So this also tells us that if we know a function is differentiable at a certain point, that automatically means it must also be continuous at that point. On the other hand, if we know a function is continuous at a certain point, that doesn't automatically tell us that it's differentiable. And just as another point, the algebra of continuous functions and continuity of composition rules that we saw earlier for continuous functions work in exactly the same way for differentiable functions. So if you have two differentiable functions, you can multiply them to get another differentiable function, and you can create a composition, and that will be differentiable, and so on. But if you think about it, if you've studied calculus before, then you already know these things are true, because when we talk about differentiating a product of differentiable functions, there's a rule in calculus called the product rule, which tells us how to do that. And for a composition, there's a rule called the chain rule. So these are rules that we already know from calculus, but it's good to know that if you ever needed to prove these things, which we're not going to do in this tutorial, the proofs do exist, and can be found in textbooks, etc. So now we're going to look at the classic example of a function which is continuous at a certain point, but not differentiable at that point. This is the function f of x equals modulus of x, which has the familiar v-shape, with a sharp point at x equals zero. And we're going to start by proving that it's continuous at all points, and then we're going to show that it's not differentiable at x equals zero.
So even though this is a fairly standard example, it's important to understand how to prove these things in a proper way without just looking at the shape of the graph. So that's what we're going to do. First, notice that we can rewrite the function in a piecewise way. So we can say that our function f of x equals modulus of x is equal to x when x is greater than or equal to zero, and it's equal to minus x otherwise. And the reason we write it this way is that x and minus x are just polynomials, so we'll be able to use what we know about polynomials. So first of all, imagine that we have a fixed point x0 which is not equal to zero, because we're going to start by proving the function is continuous at all non-zero points. So x0 could be positive or negative. Now if x0 is not equal to zero, then no matter how close to zero it is, we can always draw a small interval around the point x0, which doesn't include zero. So if x0 is positive, we can draw a small interval around x0, which only includes positive values. And if x0 is negative, we can draw a small interval around x0, which only includes negative values. So we might have to make the interval very small if x0 is very close to zero, but it's always possible to do that. So what we're saying is, for example, if x0 is this point here, we can draw an interval around it, which only includes positive values of x, and therefore the modulus of x is just equal to x for all the values of x in this interval. Now, why are we talking about an interval around x0? Well, remember, when we're trying to prove continuity at a certain point, we're trying to prove this statement here. So we need to look at the limit of the function as x approaches x0. So it's not good enough to just look at the value of the function at the point x0. We can't just say, well, we know the function is always equal to either x or minus x, and those things are just polynomials, so therefore it has to be continuous. We have to look at the limit as x approaches x0. And that actually means that we need to look at the limit from both directions. So we need to look at the limit as x approaches x0 from the left-hand side, and the limit as x approaches x0 from the right-hand side. However, having said that, if we know that our function is equal to x everywhere in a small interval around x0, or if it's equal to minus x everywhere in the interval, then we can say that it must be continuous at x0, because we know that x and minus x are continuous functions. So therefore, we know this limit and this limit, and that's good enough to tell us that our function is continuous at all non-zero points. So really, the point we're trying to get across is that in order to show a function is continuous at a certain point, it's sufficient to just look at what happens in a small interval around that point, and you can make the interval as small as you like. Because remember, in the formal definition of limits, we have a quantity called delta, which specifies how close x is to x0, and we can choose the value of delta, so that means we can choose how close we want x to be to x0. So it's easy enough to show f of x is continuous at non-zero values of x, but when we consider the point x0 equals 0, the problem is that the function is defined differently to the left of 0 and to the right of 0. So it's no longer possible to find an interval around x0 such that we're just looking at the same polynomial function everywhere inside the interval, because our function is equal to minus x on one side of the interval and x on the other. And this is true no matter how small we make the interval. So what this means is we have to consider left-hand and right-hand limits separately. And in this example, it's quite easy because on the left-hand side of zero, we're just looking at the limit of minus x as x approaches zero. And we know that's equal to zero because of continuity. And similarly, on the right-hand side of zero, we've got the limit of x as x approaches zero, which again is just zero. And since these limits are equal, we can conclude that f of x does approach a limit of zero as x approaches zero. And since f of zero equals zero, using the definition of continuity, that proves our function is continuous at zero. So moving on, what we want to do next is show the function is not differentiable at x zero equals zero. So just to point out, the function is differentiable at all non-zero values of x, and you can prove that 
in the same way that we proved the function was continuous at non-zero values of x. So we're only going to look at what happens at the origin. And at the origin, we obviously have a sharp point on the graph, so it's not smooth there, which means it's not going to be differentiable. So to prove that, we have to show that this limit does not exist. The limit as x approaches zero of f of x minus f of zero over x minus zero. And just as a note, you might prefer to use this formula instead. The limit as h approaches zero of f of zero plus h minus f of zero over h. The two definitions are completely equivalent, so it's up to you which one you prefer to use. And we're going to use left-hand and right-hand limits again, because that's the way to show that the slope of the graph on the left-hand side of zero is not the same as the slope on the right-hand side. So when we're thinking of x approaching zero from the left-hand side, that means we're thinking of x being negative, and therefore our function f of x is equal to minus x. So we end up taking the limit of minus x over x, which is minus 1, which is just a constant, and when we take the limit of a constant, it doesn't change anything, so our limit turns out to be minus 1. And of course that's completely expected, because we know the gradient of the straight line over here is minus 1. On the other hand, when we look at the right-hand limit, this time we're thinking of x approaching 0 from the right-hand side, which means x is positive, so we're taking the limit of x over x, which is just 1, so this time our limit is 1. So the two one-sided limits are different. We have minus 1 from the left-hand side and 1 from the right-hand side, and that means this limit does not exist, because the limit can only exist if the two one-sided limits are equal. So the conclusion is that since this limit does not exist, our function f of x equals modulus of x is not differentiable at 0. And just one more point before we move on. We say that a function is continuous if it's continuous at every point in its maximal domain. And similarly, we say that it's differentiable if it's differentiable at every point in its maximal domain. So the previous example shows the modulus of x is a continuous function, meaning that it's continuous at every point, but we say it's not differentiable, meaning that there is at least one point where the function is non-differentiable. So even though it is differentiable at every point other than zero, the fact that we have one point where the function isn't differentiable means that it's not what we refer to as a differentiable function. And in the third part of this tutorial, we'll have a look at some theorems for continuous and differentiable functions and some further examples.